everybody. Welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm William. This is the podcast where we talk about everything tabletop role-playing games. And today we are talking about 11 different legendary weapons of D&D. One, two, three, four. Hey, Brian. Hey, Will. How you doing today? Your name has an 11 in it. <laughs> nah, yeah, really. sure it does. I prefer 1T1. What? Or 11T. 11D. Uh, I do like it. You know I like 11D. I'm wearing a Lord of the Rings shirt. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're talking about le- more legendary weapons today? Indeed we are. Oh, For man. items and artifacts of legend has been the focus of our year. Hell yeah. Year. It has, actually. Mm-hmm. So far, we have covered 12 major artifacts, 7 legendary wondrous items, 6 legendary wondrous or legendary, legendary swords, 8 legendary armors, and 7 various legendary staves, rods, and wands. Yeah, we're waiting for the 5 golden rings for <laughs> later in the month. Cause Indeed. You know, holidays. But you know what this list is missing, Brian? F- besides 5 golden besides rings. Besides the 5 golden rings. What is it missing? Any weapon that is not a sword. Anything that you didn't list besides <laughs> five golden rings. Okay. Believe it or not, this game of swords and sorcery has more than just swords with which you may slay your foes. Axes, spears, pikes, daggers, and hammers deserve some representation in this year of the artifact. Nice. So today I've compiled 11 legendary weapons for us to talk about, and none of them are swords. That's cool. I like the uniqueness uh, when there's character building. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, everybody's got a sword. Why don't I use yeah. this? Nunchucks. I love swords. I do. I I will always love swords. And I've rolled many characters that focus on having a sword. But as I've grown older, I find myself more and more drawn to anything that is not a sword. Mostly pole arms, but also axes and sometimes even hammers. Sometimes even hammers. I like I like dual hand axes. That's been a fun one for a lot of people in my games. That's pretty cool. Also, I like swords with guns in them. Gun blades are great. Yeah. <laughs> they don't exist in this game, I'm pretty sure. But they do exist but in Final Fantasy VIII. They kind of exist in this game, like, especially with the crit roll stuff. Like, there's a... Um, uh, I'd have a little more to it. And yeah. if there's a gun and a sword, why don't you just smash them together? Yeah. Absolutely. In a good way. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, first on our list is a magical and intelligent battle axe by the name of Azure Edge, or Azure Edge. It, I guess it just depends on how you say Azure. Azurage. Azurage. Yeah. Forged by, oh, cool, this guy's back again. Forged by Agaron, the mage. Good enough for me. Who was mentioned a couple times in our legendary Staves, Rods, and Wands episode as the creator of the Staff of Agaron. Uh, its wielder is considered the greatest protector of Waterdeep. Aww. This is particularly impressive as the city has a ton of protecting figure spells and other fail safes. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. I added some in a homebrew game called Flashbang Surgeon. <laughs> Indeed you did. Uh-huh. Azure Edge is said to have a solid steel handle etched with tiny runes, wrapped in blue dragon hide with a star sapphire set into the pommel. This handle is connected to a double-bladed head forged from silver, electrum, and steel alloys, the edges of which constantly shimmer a deep blue luminescence. The blade has six more runes etched into it, one beside each of the four edges, and one in the center of both sides of the head. These runes glow blue when certain of the axe's powers are activated. It should also be noted that this axe identifies as a she. Okay. Well, uh, I love the descriptive nature like of the legendary items, like how they take extra details. Don't get used to it. I, I wish they would do it for everything. <laughs> Me at, too. Because at this level, like you're probably going to hang on to it for at least a little while. It's like worth describing in this way. I think, yeah, I think if it's legendary, I mean, I think all the items should be well described personally, but if it's legendary, I think it needs a nice juicy descriptor. And I guarantee you, most of this information does not come actually out of the module it's from. Mm-hmm. Um, it is likely from... I don't know things like Baldur's Gate Two, where this ga- this weapon was apparently used. So okay, and then they added like flavor text to mm-hmm. it to make it more interesting. Indeed, that's my I'm guessing. What yeah, I like as that. a writer picks up something mm-hmm. that it exists, they'll add their spin on it. Yes, that's good. So the axe is unwieldy, but magically balances itself in the hands of a wielder chosen by the weapon. Additionally, Azure Edge grants her wielders access to powers in accordance to how worthy she judges them. Now, we're going to look at this weapon's 5e stats in a bit. 
I have not looked into them myself as I like to have a fresh reaction live on the show. But this lore of unlocking higher powers as the weapon deems your worthiness is very in line with 4 sentient item design. Basically, a 4 artifact or sentient item has listed personality traits and goals. And as you perform actions in line with these goals or better yet, achieve some of these goals, the item's approval of you rises and at certain thresholds unlock high, unlocks higher powers. So does that make the sword's sentient nature more like a neutral? Because um, it'll let you die. Like, it, I could have been more powerful to save you. My, the way I interpret it is, like, the sword's power has to be unlocked. Like, the sword can't, it's like much like a Pokemon. It cannot reach its full potential without a trainer. I see. Okay. Who is worthy and actually trains it. So the sword could be good. It's yes. just that, or not a sword, or whatever, you know. It, it could, yeah. the item could be good. Yeah. But can't be great unless you are great. Worthy exactly. enough. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, that's better. <laughs> than the sword being like, you're not worthy, dude. And you're, you're sorry, bro. Sucks to suck. Get good. Get good, bro. Oh, you can't. You're dead. Nah. <laughs> the intelligence within Azure Edge has a limited ability to detect the moral alignments of people and can stick to things with the strength of sovereign glue when she does not wish to be wielded by someone. She can communicate with both speech and telepathy and can actively resist identification magic. Oh, wow. Long ago, a figure by the name of Lady... Laraun was warlord of Waterdeep. She was a just but violent ruler, and Agaron did not foresee another warlord as honorable as she taking up the mantle in the future of the city. He thus obeyed her final request to ensure that she would always be able to aid the defense of the City of Splendors by binding a part of her departing soul to a magical battle axe that he was due to give her before she was slain. Oh, that's such a cool the city of the city of Splendors. Oh, yeah, I fucking nice. love yeah, that shit. Cool. Yes. Uh, okay, so the creator. Uh, this guy, uh, yeah. Agaron, he's mm -hmm. neutral because he could have unlocked all the powers of the sword <laughs> to save your life and didn't. I don't know. I, I, it's all very ephemeral. I bet there's stories like, um, you know, since it's water deep related, like of like why it works that way. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Let us know in the comments, or you know, maybe Diggy will just drop his super knowledge into uh into yeah, Discord for us. Nice. Thank you, Diggy. So that's all I have on Azure Edge. I'm ready for the stats. Oh, we're going to do it like that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, <laughs> let me uh, jump over to I have it up. Uh, it was just in another application. So we have the Azure Edge. It's a weapon battle axe. Legendary requires attunement. That's going to take an hour. Um, we got some lore here. Uh, you gain a plus three bonus attack and damage uh, rolls made with this magic weapon. The shield spell provides no defense against the axe, which oh, passes shit. through the spell's Damn. barrier of magic force. Can you imagine being a wizard like, like I'm shoot. good. Ah. Oh, fuck, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, um, when you hit a fiend or an undead with the axe, cold blue flames erupt from its blade and deal an extra 2d6 radiant damage to the target. Super nice. Very cool. Hurling, the battle axe has three charges. You can expend one charge and make a ranged attack with the axe, hurling it as if it had the throne property with a normal range of 60 feet and a long range of 180 feet. Whether it hits or misses, that's so fucking far. It's very far. Even it's 60 feet almost, is pretty fucking far. Is that two football fields? How many, how many feet is a football field? No, it's yards. I do a hockey. You do a hockey. It's a 200-foot rink, man. I okay, so it's almost a full rink. I feel so fucking American right now. <laughs> Slash Canadian. I mean, I don't feel very American because I, I asked the question about American football because I have no fucking idea what the answer is. We're, we're sitting in front of an internet browser, so you could figure it out while I, I read. Yes, I could. I'm not going to. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just got a YouTube comment. Score. Yeah, I bet we did. Uh, landing in your... Okay, let's see. Whether it hits or misses, the axe flies back to you at the end of the current turn. Uh, landing in your open hand or at your feet in your space as you choose, the axe regains all expended charges daily at dawn. Why would you ever choose at your feet? I wonder. I wonder why. Probably because you're, you know, shaking the living crap out of somebody. Okay. You know? Not now, axe. My, at my feet, please. To the floor. Oh, no, go to my hands. I'm holding a guy. I want him dead. Yeah, see? So why would you ever put it at your feet? <laughs> is it going to be like a Thor's hammer situation where it, like, tries so hard to go back to the hand, it just obliterates whatever in its way? In its way? Ah, I, I think it's it's just based on the context of the situation. Either way, though, three free, incredibly ranged attacks is nice with this very strong weapon. <laughs> we got a runner. Whew. There you go. <laughs> Illumination. While holding the axe, you can use an action to cause the axe to glow blue or to quench the glow. This glow sheds bright light in a 30-foot radius and dim light for an additional 30 feet. Okay. 
Sentience, Azure Edge's sentient, lawful, neutral weapon with an intelligence of 12, a wisdom of 15, and a charisma of 15. You called it on the neutral. It did. Uh, it's written right there. Mm -hmm. Can't argue it. Uh, it has hearing and dark vision out to a range of 120 feet. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Good job, Axe. You you play D&D. &D. <laughs> uh, the weapon communicates telepathically with its wielder and can speak, read, and understand common. It has a calm, delicate voice. That's a DM tip right there. Indeed. Change it if you want. <laughs> it's me, your girl, Axe. That's fine. The weapon can sense the presence of non-lawful creatures with 120 feet of it. Personality. Azure Edge is sworn to protect Waterdeep. It, uh, and it desires to be wielded by a law-abiding person willing to dedicate everything to the city's defense. Oof. The weapon is patient and takes its time finding its ideal wielder. Uh, yeah, a politician is like a, or a warlord. That's that's a good pick for sure, like how it said in the lore. Mm -hmm. If someone tries to use Azure Edge against its will, the axe can become ten times heavier than normal. Very heavy. And Oh, that can make it more good. <laughs> in the hands of a giant, yes. <laughs> yeah, can, uh, and can magically adhere to any medium or larger object or surface it comes into contact with. So it's a lot like Thor's hammer, a lot more than I thought. Yeah. Uh, once it does so, the axe can't be wielded. Nothing short of a wish spell can separate the axe from the item or surface to which it is adhered without destroying one or the other, though the axe can choose to end the effect at any time. That's wild. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I get that it's 10 times heavier. So, like, yeah, anything outside of a, I don't know, I'll just say fire giant or bigger isn't going to be able to wield it. But what's making a fire giant not able to wield this? You know what I mean? It's stuck to his hand. It is, it's super heavy, but he's super strong. Well, this adherence thing is, is what does it. Yeah, I, I guess. Why well, have both? You could use it once. You could stab one thing and then it'll stick to that thing and now you can't stab no more. Is that right? what it, once it does so the axe can't be nothing short of okay what does it say it just says once it does so the axe can't be wielded so I was like what's stopping the actual wielding besides the weight and the stickiness which I I, I comfortably think a fire giant could get one blow in with the sword maybe before if it just stuck, sticks to whatever if it, it's stuck to the fucking like earth or whatever I don't know like, well yeah no I just mean if it's already in in the fire giant's hand. Right, and then fire giant picks it up, and it's like, sticky. oh shit, yeah, and it's like, oh, I don't want to be wielded. Well, can it, uh, yeah, medium or larger object or surface it comes into contact. So you're saying once you, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. you could probably, yeah, you get one, you probably get one get swing. One. Then the axe is like, oh, I'm so heavy, and it's like, oh no, you're gonna swing me anyway and do way more damage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right, moving on. You make a good point. Thank you. Let's move on to the <laughs> next item. <laughs> Okay, hold on. It, it's a cool. It's a cool weapon. I think oh, it's a yeah. really cool. <laughs> okay, let's um scale of one to ten on uh magic. on cool factor on cool factor. Ooh. Yeah, I I nine. This is a really good weapon. The throw the throw really um really carries it for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm gonna give it a seven because of the context factor here. Um, very cool, but like, are you gonna protect water? Oh deep? yeah, you are tied to water. Deep. Not useful. Okay, seven. <laughs> yeah, like it's an NPC item. Fuck water deep. This no, is okay. this is an item for an NPC to wield in water. Deep. In, yeah, in water. Deep. And if you are defending water deep and that person goes down, you can pick up their weapon, and that's a cool hook. It is a cool. Hook. So maybe seven and a half. I'll give it eight. Moving on, we'll give it an eight. Okay, the dungeon cast rates the Azure Edge an eight on the. I like how we factor. started the rating system on meet what might be the last legendary anything episode we do this year. Hey, uh, okay. Well, maybe we'll do a. Uh, maybe we'll like. Okay, what. Yeah, we'll talk about this later. All right. Next up, we are leaving behind the setting of Forgotten Realms and into the setting of Dragonlance, where we will be talking about Dragonlances. Who to thunk it? The Dragonlances. Yeah. That's Dragon right. Lance. Dragonlance isn't just the name of the setting, but of the mythical weapons used for slaying evil dragons from that setting. Yeah, you can't beat D and D in the Dragonlance setting without a Dragonlance. No, no, it's canon. The Dragon Lance, also known as the Spear of Paladine or Great Lance, is a weapon that comes in two forms, the Footman's Pike and the Mounted Lance, which can be used either by foot soldiers or by mounted upon those mounted upon dragon back, respectively. The lances are made of dragon metal that is found at the Silver Dragon Mountain in southern Urgoth. In the old days, it was said that only a smith with the knowledge uh, how to make the Dragon Lance imparted upon him him uh, by a god, the silver arm of Ergoth, and the hammer of Karis could then forge dragon lances. So you need three things. You need the knowledge. 
You need this artificial arm, which means that you lost an arm, and you put this one on, and you need this super great hammer. Oh, weird. You need a full extra arm. Yeah, that was in the old days. Okay, that was that was a long time ago. There is an exception. A person with only one of the two recommended artifacts can still forge a dragon lance, but these are referred to as lesser dragon lances compared to lances made with both artifacts, referred to as greater dragon lances. Okay, not a wyvern lance. No, not a wyvern lance. A drake lance. A drake lance. A mounted dragon lance is roughly 18 feet in length and is used mounted on, on a dragon saddle. It is said that all the dragon lances are well balanced. The tip of the lance tapers off to a sharp point, has barbs on both sides of the dragon lance head, two feet from the tip. The haft and head are what are made out of the dragon metal, while the pole in between is hardened wood. And at the haft is an elaborate shield guard that looks like a dragon. Um, they can absorb magic when. It says cast up, but I'm, I'm probably um, lifted up in general, the shield. Yeah, yeah. like when you're going to cast a, like a, fish, a fishing rod or whatever, like you're going to throw a cast. There we go. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, that's probably exactly okay. it. A footman's lance is roughly eight feet in length and can easily be used by a soldier on the ground against a chromatic dragon. Otherwise, it is identical to the mounted version. Yeah, eight feet's a lot. Eight feet is a lot. It's a pike. So, yeah, yeah, those are, that's a big weapon. Yeah, it's a big, pikes are big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The first dragon lance was created by Duncan Ironweaver during the Third Dragon War, when the forces of good were in their most desperate need. Huma Dragonbane had passed his three tests set before him when he was offered 20 mounted dragon lances and one footman's lance. With these, he was able to stall for the rest of the dragon lances to arrive and help the Knights of Salomnia win the war. During this, Huma was able to even hit the goddess Tachesis with his lance and with the pain he inflicted upon her, extracted an oath from her to leave Kryn. With the loss of any potential threat from chromatic dragons, the dragon lance faded into myth until another war came along with another desperate need. I see. I like Duncan Ironweaver for his name. It's a cool name. Uh, he's dunking them lances on these dragons. Absolutely. It has to be. has to be. This new war uh, was named the War of the Lance after the famed dragon lances. During this war, a smith by the name of Theros Ironfeld found the silver arm of Aragoth. By the way, this war takes place like 1,200 years later. I, oh, I skipped damn. a lot of time. Okay. So after the War of was it the War of Might? No, it wasn't the War of Might, was it? Third Third Dragon War. After the Third Dragon War, uh, we go into the Age of Might. That's it. And in the Age of Might, it's kind of like the um, the Renaissance. The uh, it's the Golden Era, right? I see. Which ends okay. in the Cataclysm, like I think like seven hundred years into it or whatever. Mm. And then a couple hundred years after that is when we get to the War of the Lance. And by then, there are no Dragon Lances again. I see. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So where were we? Um, Pretty much at the end of this. Oh, yeah. There's Ironfield finds the Silver Arm of Aragoth and was granted the knowledge on how to create the Lances by a Silver Dragon named Silvara. With this knowledge, Theris created many Lances for the Knights of Salomnia to fight with. Uh, it would be another 31 years before the Dragon Lances would again be used on a grand scale. During the Chaos War, this is, yeah, 30 years later, um, the Lances were used to fight against the, the Knights of Tachesis, and then when Father Chaos attacked Kryn, by the combined last rem remaining remnants of the Knights of Tachesis and Knights, Knights of Salomnia together against his Chaos Spawn and Fire Dragons. Following this war, the Lances rem uh, remaining were very few, uh, and some were still used by the Nazi Salomnia, and it is unknown if there's anyone left alive who could still forge them. Okay, until there, a great need comes, and then yeah. the knowledge will be given. Until uh, Margaret the... Weiss needs to write another Dragonlance book. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like, uh, you shouldn't be walking around with these super powerful weapons, like exactly. in the normal times. Right. But when the time comes, we'll, super, we'll soup you up. Indeed. And the Indeed. dragons are like, there's no more Dragonlances, we'll win. And all the old dragons have aged out, so they yep. think they can do it. But then the dragon lances show up. <laughs> They're like, no, we could have never known. Let me tell you, this That's isn't so a long stat block, so let me tell you why dragon lances are cool. They're weapons, not our lances are pikes, like we said. They're mm -hmm. legendary, and they require attunement. A dragon lance is a, oh, we read that that stuff. Sorry, I always start reading the lore and then realize I don't need to read that. Yeah, it's a very little blurp of lore. You gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. And then when you hit a dragon with this weapon, <laughs> the dragon takes an extra 3d6 of force damage. It's not going to resist that. No. And any dragon of your choice that you can see within 30 feet of you can immediately use its reaction to make a melee attack. So if you're riding a dragon, yes. you can lance it, and mm -hmm. then your dragon can do more mm -hmm. dragon mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, one of That's the pretty cool. <laughs> one of the coolest things about Dragonlance the series is... 
you get right up in it and it's it's literally knights riding on the backs of golden and silver dragons as you know them in dungeons of dragons and fighting evil dudes riding reds and greens and black dragons and it's just it's just dragon palooza and it's crazy <laughs> yeah you can roll up with multiple and seven-year-old me loved it oh hell yeah that sounds great you can roll up with multiple dragons on your person i guess theoretically and make multi-attack with the I want to do dual lan- dragon lances. Well, if you get three attacks, right? Like, and you hit. That's true. Three attacks. That's true, dude. So a it, fighter, the dragon on is the th- back of a dragon. Yeah. with one of these it's, is just unrivaled. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like the the dragon is using its reaction, not you. So oh wait, but the, the dragon only so gets you need the multiple one. dragons. You do. Yeah. So if you roll <laughs> you gotta up, straddle three. If you got a chariot, just lie. If you have Santa's sleigh and it's dragons all the way down can instead get, of reindeer. Can I get a three headed dragon that has three reactions? That's what I need. Oh, that's sick. Actually, that's pretty good. That'd be pretty cool. Well, maybe your dragon also, if you're riding a dragon, and it's maybe you're riding a legendary dragon. I think who knows? I think hydras get multiple reactions. Hold on, I gotta pull this up. What we need is a dragon to fuck a hydra, and make a, <laughs> make a super dragon. Damn it! That's what we've needed all this time. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta back up my claims. I'm wondering with, how with to make the show popular beyond its current scope, and it's that we need dragons fucking hydras and having babies. There's probably a Dragon Magazine article about Reactive exactly heads. For about. each head the hydra has beyond one, it gets an extra reaction. This is what we need. It's not called Hydra Lance. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> we need to... No, you want them to fuck. <laughs> it would be pretty cool. It would. Absolutely. It would be pretty cool. I like having three dragons, but I'm like a t- riding Tiamat into battle is cool, too. Yes, absolutely it is. All right. Um, glad we solved that. I give the Dragon Lance <laughs> nine out of ten. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it an eight point three out of All ten. Right. Moving on. All right. The next weapon is uh, named has a name. It's a singular name. It's called Drown. <laughs> Good lead up. Now, I know why you would. I would. Yeah. For anyone, I get it. For anyone wondering, we've been recording for like seven hours straight. At this point. <laughs> That's true. We are tacking a Dungeon Cast episode onto the back of two unhallowed episodes. I am losing my fucking recordings. mind right now. Unhallowed is a really cool thing we're going to put on Patreon sometime <laughs> in the future. When eventually, it gets finished. Yeah, we have to finish. We're making fourteen it. episodes deep. Oh my god, it's pretty cool though. Yeah, it's been fun. All right, back to back to this episode. <laughs> It'll be on. We Patreon. have another weapon named Drown. Right. And this weapon is in a way part of a set of four weapons, each made by the same person and each infused with the essence of an elemental prince of evil. Okay. Drown is a trident forged by the Drow wizard Viserion Devere. With the power of Ol Hydra, oh god, the Hydras are back. <laughs> no, with the power of Ol Hydra, Princess of Evil Water, infused in it, and famously wielded by Gar Shatterkeel, Prophet of Water and leader of the Cult of the Crushing Wave. Aren't there like big Titan esque monsters that we talked about on the show that are like elemental like this? Yes, they primordials. Kind of, primordials. That's yes, what they were. And the the princes of elemental evil are, they're I think they're called anarcho elementals. And they're they're essentially primordials that represent like a particular element. There's four, one for each element, and uh, they're like demon lord level power. Okay. Yeah, there's Imix, Ol Hydra, um, Yancy, Bin, and I forgot who the fourth one is, but we'll see it uh, on here later. Um, but anyways, they sound cool. Yes, they, they do. Sound super cool. They do sound super cool. Um, so let's start with Vizarin Devere. Okay. Now, so we don't have to go over him for all four of these weapons. Vizier and Devere was an exile drow archmage during the late 15th century DR. Um, that is the that date is from Forgotten Realms. We're back in Forgotten Realms, guys. The scion of House Devere, Vizirin, studied the arcane arts amongst the Lolth dominated society of the drow, but was secretly devoted to the elder elemental eye, i.e., there is Dune. Mm. Why? I don't know. Except to say that I actually don't think it's unusual for male drow from Loth dominated society to be attracted to other gods, as Loth has 90% of drow males essentially enslaved. Right. Uh, the exception, to some extent, are excuse me, male ar- arcane practitioners, who are the only males in their society allowed even a modicum of power. Okay. Yeah. Um, that being said, Vizirin was exposed as a non believer of Loth by a colleague of his, leading to his disgrace and exile. Ironically, this spared Vizarin from the downfall of House Devere at the hands of House Dererdin, which is the house Drizzt would have come from. But I don't think he would have been involved with this, but maybe he was. I don't read the books. I don't know. Yeah, you gotta. You either um, 
do what this guy did, or you escape and become the greatest uh, like uh, material plane hero, hero of all that's time. ever existed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you get a cat. Uh, yeah. In his exile, he became a great archmage, building his tower of Arage and plotting his revenge. Centuries before the current date, Vizarin Devere crafted the weapons Iron Fang, Drown, Wind Vane, and Tinder Strike for the elemental evil cults. Drown is a steel trident decorated with bronze barnacles along the upper part of its haft. Drown has a sea green jewel just below the tines and a silver shell at the end of its haft. It floats on the surface of water if dropped, and it floats in place if it is released underwater. That's pretty fucking it's, cool. It's very, very, very Fuck cool the tides. style. Yeah. The trident is always cool to the touch, and it is immune to any damage due to exposure to water. I like this a lot. So far, so good. I like tridents, uh, and I have a lot of beef with Wizards of the Coast for making tridents like the actively mechanically worst weapon amongst the martial weapons. That's a bummer. Yes. You know what doesn't work with polearm mastery? Tridents. That's weird. Yeah. I feel like there should be categories of weapons. I agree. And oh, I think okay, trident cool. should be a polearm. Yeah, like yeah. there should be like the weapons in this category do this damage. I I agree. Okay. Well, yeah. fuck them. Uh, <laughs> look, let's see. Uh, maybe they'll change it. They're making changes, right? Um, yeah. I, I like weapons named as verbs. Oh, cool. Yeah. I don't know if there's any more, but <laughs> yay drown. Yay drown. Okay. So stat block time. Yeah. Stat block time. Let's go. All right. You gain a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls you make with this weapon. When you hit with it, the target takes an extra one D eight cold damage. Uh, it's nice. We like that. Oh yeah. Water mastery. You gain the following benefits while you hold drown. You can speak Aquan fluently, which is a subsect of Primordial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have resistance to cold damage. You can cast Dominate Monster, save DC 17 on a water elemental. Uh, once you have done so, Drown can't be used this way again until the next dawn. So nice daily. Or Yeah, if you, if you got a water elemental in the area. I mean, you might. Yeah. I mean, you have Drown. You very well might. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. All right. Tears of Endless Anguish. While inside a water node, you can perform a ritual called the Tears of Endless Anguish, using Drown to create a devastation orb of water. See the devastation orb description. Uh, I'm, I'm doing that. Oh, thanks. Devastation orb is a, holy shit, this is long. That's well, a long thing. You keep let's going. not worry about it too much. When, yeah. Once you perform the ritual, Drown can't be used to perform the ritual again until the next dawn. Uh, flaw, Drown makes its wielder covetous. Mm. While attuned to the weapon, you gain the following flaw. I demand and deserve the largest share of the spoils, and I refuse to part with anything that's mine. In addition, if you are attuned to drown for 24 consecutive hours, barnacles, or barnacles <laughs> form on your skin. The barnacles can be removed with a greater restoration spell or similar magic, but not while you are attuned to the weapon. Part of the trident, part of the crew. Indeed. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Did you garner anything from this ritual in our? Oh, um. So the the devastation orb is in itself a very rare wondrous item. Oh, damn. Um, and there's one for each of the four elements. Oh, damn. So let's read this and go from there because it's okay. going to come up all four times. Uh, do you want me to go in there and do it? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, let me pull. Let me pull mm. that up. All right. From the top, huh? A yep. devastation orb is an elemental bomb that can be created at the site of an elemental node by performing a ritual with an elemental weapon. The type of orb created depends on the node used. For example, an air node creates a devastation orb of air. The ritual takes one hour to complete and requires 2,000 gold pieces worth of special components, which are consumed. So let's go to... Oh, well, I guess I should read. Yeah, I think we got to read the Me whole thing. Measures 12 inches in diameter, weighs 10 pounds, has a solid outer shell. The orb detonates uh, 1d100 hours after its creation. Will, would you like to roll a d100 uh, while I read this and yeah, sure. figure out how many hours we have until we die? Okay. Uh, Releasing the elemental energy it contains, the orb gives no outward sign of how much time remains before it will detonate. Spells such as identify and divination can be used to ascertain when the orb will explode. An orb has AC 10, 15 HP, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. We have 88 hours. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, reducing it to zero hit points causes it to explode instantly, so you can mm. just bomb on it. That's true. A special container can be crafted to contain a devastation orb and prevent it from detonating. I would like to use a lich's phylactery for that. That's <laughs> sick. 
Uh, the container must be inscribed with symbols of the orb's opposing element. For example, a case inscribed with the Earth symbols can be used to contain a devastation orb of air and keep it from detonating. While in the container, the orb thrums. If it is removed from the container after the time when it was supposed to detonate, it explodes 1d6 rounds later. Will, can you roll a d6 for us? Rounds? Yep. I got four rounds. You That's got 40 seconds, baby. Yeah. Unless it is returned to the container. Uh, regardless of the type, that's a cool, like, yeah, oh, oh, fucking, I'm going to hold it out here. I'm not going to put it back. <laughs> oh, you shit. give me what I want. <laughs> regardless of the type of orb, its effect is contained within a sphere of a one mile radius. The orb is the sphere's point of origin. The orb is destroyed after one use. And now it lists the specificities of each element. So we'll go down to water. <clears throat> yes. When this orb detonates, it creates a torrential rainstorm that lasts for 24 hours within the area of effect the rules for heavy precipitation apply. As detailed in Chapter 5 of the DMG, if there is a substantial body of water in the area, it floods after 2d10 hours of heavy rain, rising 10 feet above its banks and inundating the surrounding area. The flood advances at a rate of 100 feet per round, moving away from the body of water where it began until it reaches the edge of the area of effect. It floods in 10 hours. Nice. Like 10 hours before they flood. Cool. At that point, the water flows downhill and possibly recedes back to its origin. Light structures collapse and wash away. Ooh. Any large or smaller creature caught in the flood's path is also swept away. Oh, shit. The flooding destroys crops and might trigger mudslides depending on the terrain. So this is a catastrophic uh I mean, Devastation disaster. Orb. Devastation Orb is a very correct name. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, maybe one day we'll go get around to reading the air, earth, and fire. Um, but for right one now. One day, you mean later this episode. Oh, are we doing the other ones? We're too? doing the other ones. They're all legendary weapons that aren't swords. Oh, I've only got the um Okay. Sounds good to me. It'll be in the back half of the episode. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Oh. All right. Next up, what do we got? We got the flail of Tiamat. Sick. <clears throat> Introduced in Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. Fizban! Unfortunately, there's absolutely, and I do mean absolutely no lore on this bad boy. <laughs> This magic flail is made in the image of Tiamat, with five jagged heads shaped like the heads of five different chromatic dragons. One would imagine this weapon would be wielded by a chosen of Tiamat or a leader of her cult. Weren't we just like spitballing about like Jupiter's flail or whatever? And I was like, all the we were, yeah, 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 yeah that's pretty fun. That was fun. Uh, this sounds a lot like that. I mean, the the lore of this item is Tiamat's lore, I guess, which is like, I'm we a, have a whole episode on. I'm her. a demon dragon chick that likes to fuck and devil. Devil dragon chick that likes to fuck and hang out. Yeah. Be evil. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do dragon stuff. Escape hell. That's Escape one of her hell. main things. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do it with the flail. Okay. And I'm going to read stats. the stats, <laughs> which is probably the interesting part. Weapon flail legendary requires attunement. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We didn't rate drown. Ooh. I'm going to give it two ratings. I think uh, like lore and flavor, 10 out of 10. Okay. I think actual functionality, 8 out of 10. Mm. No, seven out of ten. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was really cool, and these orb things are cool. Um, yeah, because it makes a big orb. If you do, it's the a, it's an evil person's weapon. I mean, it, wielding it makes you evil in a certain sense. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. it also grows barnacles on your face. Ah, yeah, ten out of ten for me. <laughs> Hell yeah! All right, flail to you, man. Let's yeah, go. Ten out of ten. All right, all right, flail to you, Matt. Um. Five jagged heads, you know the drill. You gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with the flail. When you hit with an attack roll using it, uh, when you hit with an attack roll using it, the target takes an extra 5d4 damage of your choice of one of the following damage types acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. That's, that's so, on brand. That's so good. That's uh, just so good. I love it. While holding the flail, you can use an action and speak a command word to cause the heads to breathe multicolored flames in a 90-foot cone. Fuck yeah. Each creature in that area must make a DC 18 dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, it takes 14 D6 damage of one of the following damage types of your choice. Acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. On a successful save, it takes half as much damage. Once this action is used, it can't be used again until the <clears> next <throat> dawn. So you get a very strong weapon attack. Plus three... Mm -hmm. and an extra 5d4. Yeah, I think the natural cap is plus three for this type of stuff. Yeah, and it can you can change that damage type across five different damage types, so it's great coverage. Very versatile. Uh, and then you also get 
a choice between five different adult dragons' breath attacks. Um, ninety foot cone is in that, a ninety that's foot cone for dragon stuff. Y- that might even be ancient. I'm not even sure. That might be an ancient dragon level. Breath. Yeah, it's definitely strong. It's and you get that once a day. And again, great coverage. Your choice of five elements. Fourteen D six. I I feel like this is the most powerful weapon we've talked about today. Oh yeah, damage yeah, wise, yeah, for sure. This thing's a beast. It doesn't make a tsunami's worth of like. That's true. But drown's still. got that in its favor. Yeah, but that takes an hour. This yeah. is just sw- you're just swinging this thing. Um, I mean, in a, in a way, it takes more than an hour because it takes an hour plus a number of hours plus to detonate. Time, yeah. Um, but and then, and then enough number of hours to actually drown everybody. Basically, you make the orb on the down low and yeah. then have it in a jar that you use. It would, <laughs> it would take an equal amount of hours to kill the equal amount of people with both these weapons, but one would leave you exhausted and the other you'd be kicking back on a mountain watching your devastation. That is that is fair. <laughs> I still would go with the flail team, Matt, though. I would probably choose this one up front so I didn't have to do so much crap, but team Matt's gross. So... I, I will gross. stand by Tiamat is the grossest thing. We one of the grosser things we talk about. I don't know, man. There's Zuck Moy. It's that. Yeah. It's it's always those. It's always those guys. It's the it's the, the demons and ones. devils, and yeah. they're the grossest ones. And there's a couple that are way grosser yeah, than the other ones. It, well, there's a arch devil that lives in a poop palace. Yeah. Like how See, do we beat? That? I'm sorry. Tiamat is not that gross. Yeah, not that gross, but yeah. like Tiamat's weird. Tiamat makes me nervous. Yeah, <laughs> she should. All right, moving on. <laughs> well, we got to rate it. Oh, we got to rate it. Uh, oh, yeah, I give this one a 9 out of 10. It's a, it's just so powerful. It's getting a 6 for me. Okay. Tiamat's fucking gross. Uh, next up, we have the Hammer of Thunderbolts. Um, these are powerful enchanted dwarven hammers, as there are many of these legendary weapons. They vary in design. Some are um, hefty, angular dwarven war hammers, while others are powerful mauls. Generally, a Hammer of Thunderbolts looks like an ordinary weapon of war, albeit heavier and of a larger size than its weapon type usually are. Despite this, they are always perfectly balanced. Each Hammer of Thunderbolts possesses a true name, and the weapon's real powers are only revealed to those who know it. When swung in battle, each hit with the weapon unleashes great noise, claps of thunder that can render the target stunned. These hammers can also be turned at an opponent unleashing the same stunning thunder damage. I like that. Yeah, then here's Thor's hammer. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, the image for this in D&D Beyond is fucking cool. It's <laughs> just like, dwarf faces. Yeah, angry dwarf back faces. Back to back. I love it. All right, it's a weapon. It's a maul. It's legendary, requires a two-minute. You get a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. Giant's Bane requires a two-minute. You must be wearing a belt of giant strength, any variety, and gauntlets of ogre power to attune to this weapon. So you need... It's it's a combo. It's right. a wombo combo. Wombo combo. That's three items. Yeah. They're probably not... Like, the hardest thing to get is probably this hammer, right? See, gauntlets of ogre strength are un- un- ogre power uncommon, and belt of giant strength varies, but the lowest one, the hill giant strength, is rare. So, okay, so it's going to be tough, but, yeah. you know, it's possible. Yeah. You find the right vault, you probably find all of these, or most of them. Um, let's see. So you need those things. The attunement ends if you take off either of those items. While you are attuned to this weapon and holding it, your strength score increases by 4 and can exceed 20, but not 30. When you roll a 20 on an attack roll made with this weapon against a giant, the giant must succeed on a DC 17 constitution saving throw or die. Oh, shit. <laughs> the hammer Damn. also has five. This fucking hammer hates giants. I know. The <laughs> hammer also has five charges. While attuned to it, you can expend one charge and make a ranged weapon attack with the hammer, hurling it as if it had the throne property with a normal range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet. If the attack hits, the hammer unleashes a thunderclap audible out to 300 feet. The target and every creature within 30 feet of it must succeed on a DC 17 constitution saving throw or be stunned until the end of your next turn. The hammer regains 1d4 plus 1 expended charges daily at dawn. <clears throat> this is cool. It's a cool weapon. I'm it's a cool give, weapon. I'm going to give it a 5, though, because it yeah. needs too much shit. I'm also going to give it a 5. Um... Partially because it needs the other components, and that's so it can't stand on its own. Yeah, and the, more importantly, in, in my opinion, to me, is it's called the Hammer of Thunder Bolts, 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 and I don't see a single lightning, lightning damage or bolt attack that comes from this thing. Yeah, it should just be called the Hammer of Thunder. Indeed, and as a person who is a big fan of lightning, of the damage type, thunder's okay. Um, I'm disappointed. Is a thunderbolt 
like what what happens when you like Google definition thunderbolt? I, hey, I got Google right here, man. Yeah, thunderbolt define. I feel like I need to know this. A flash of lightning. Yeah. See, weird. It's a With weird the name. Simultaneous crash of thunder. It's a weird name for that because it seems backwards, right? Well, like a thunderbolt. That's thunder is sound. Bolt is electricity. The lightning. Yeah. Yeah. This is know. the bolt that belongs to the thunder. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm into that. Yeah. So Agreed. this hammer is wrong. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. No lightning effects. All right. You five, heard it from here. Five Hammer Thunderbolts. Ten. Five out of five ten. Out of ten. Um, Just, next up. Okay. One more before the short rest. We have Iron Fang, our second of the elemental weapons that could create devastation orbs. Didn't that do really bad on Netflix? Just kidding. That's an Iron Fist joke. Do you remember how mad everybody was about Iron Fist? God, I forgot that show existed. That show was not that good. That show was not good. There, there it is, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. You also heard it here again later on for the, probably the second or third time that the Dungeon Cast... This is a thumbs down on Iron Fist. What is Iron Fang, though? Iron Fang is an enchanted war pick created by Vizarin Devere, the drow wizard. He's back. And infused with the power of the prince of evil earth, Ogre Mosh. Or Ogre Mock? I go Mosh. <laughs> I like Ogre Mosh better. Yeah. It implies a uh, concert. And was famously carried by the Medusa, Marlos Urnrail, prophet of earth and the leader of the cult of the black earth. Okay. Iron Fang appears to be a heavy war pick of jet black iron adorned in runes and filigree and with a black gemstone both at the bottom of its handle and center of its head. I would posit that the gemstones to likely be onyx or obsidian. Okay. I agree. Uh, tell me about Iron Fang. Iron Fang. It says uh, it's a weapon war pick. Legendary requires attunement. Um, we'll skip the lore and you gain a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls you make with this magic weapon when you hit with it the target takes an extra 1d8 thunder damage <clears throat> excuse me earth mastery you gain the following benefits while you hold iron fang you can speak Terran fluently a uh, subject of primordial mm -hmm. you have resistance to acid damage you have tremor sense out to a range of 60 feet. That's pretty cool. You can sense the presence of precious metals and stones within 60 feet of you. That's super nice. But not their exact location. You can cast Dominate Monster, save DC 17 on Earth Elemental. Once you have done so, Iron Fang can't be used this way again until next on. Shatter. Iron Fang has three charges. You can use your action to expend one charge and cast the second level version of Shatter, DC 17. Iron Fang regains 1d3 expended charges daily at dawn. That's one of my favorite spells in the Shatter's game. Shatter's nice. It's a good it's spell. really cool, yeah. high versatility, especially with this ability. You're just like, I sense diamonds. Boom, boom. Yeah, <laughs> just start fucking yeah, nuking absolutely. the road. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, the rumbling. Oh, shit. Eren Yeager. <laughs> Jesus, dude. I can't. It's the rumbling. It's like the most crazy thing to happen in anime in the last, like, five years. Uh <laughs> Who knows if we'll ever see the end of that show. They mm. keep saying it's going to happen. Uh, while inside an Earth node, you can perform a ritual called the Rumbling, using Iron Fang to create a devastation orb of Earth. And we'll go read that again. Uh, once you perform the ritual, Iron Fang can't be used to perform that ritual again until the next dawn. And then the flaw is Iron Fang heightens its wielder's destructive nature. While attuned to the weapon, you gain the following flaw. I like to activate all the titans in the walls and have them stop. <laughs> Sorry. I like to break things and cause ruin. I mean, yeah, wake up all the titans in the walls, bro. This is a pretty <laughs> huge attack on titan spoilers. Sorry, everyone. All right. Let's go over the Devastation Orb of Earth, please. Okay. It's a nice short one. I like it. Devastate. Oh, here. I still have the tab open. We just God. need the, the Earth Orb. Yep. Line. It's very short. Earth Orb. When this orb detonates, uh, its subject... It subjects the area to the effects of earthquake, uh, spell, that the earthquake spell. For one minute, spell save DC 18. For the purpose of the spell's effects, the spell is cast on the turn that the orb explodes. Okay, so we have earthquake here. It's a level eight evocation spell. Yeah. Uh, you create a seismic disturbance at the point of the ground that you can see within range for the duration and intense tremor rips through the ground in a 100 foot radius circle centered on that point and shakes creatures and structures in contact with the ground in that area the ground in the area becomes difficult to rain each creature on the ground that is concentrating must make a con saving throw on a failed save their concentration is broken when you cast a spell at the end of each turn you spend concentrating on it each creature on the ground in the area must make a dexterity saving throw on a failed save the creature is knocked prone 
The spell can have additional effects depending on the terrain in the area as determined by the dungeon master. Fissures. Fissures fissures open up throughout the spell's area at the start of your next turn after you cast the spell. A total of 1d6 such fissures open in locations chosen by the DM. Each is 1d10 times 10 deep feet deep, 10 feet wide, and extends from one edge of the spell's area to the opposite side. A creature standing on the spot where the fissure opens must succeed a dexterity saving throw or fall in creature that successfully saves within the fissure edge fissures edge as it moves to the fissures edge as it opens a fissure that opens beneath the structure causes it to automatically collapse structures Neat. a tremor dealing 50 <laughs> bludgeoning damage to any structure in contact with the ground in the area when you cast the spell and at the start of each of your turns until this wait what i i got mind fog there the tremor Deals 50 bludgeoning damage to any structure in contact with the ground. Okay, I see. Uh, uh, when you cast a spell, and at the start of each of your turns, if a structure drops to zero hit points, it collapses and potentially damages nearby creatures. A creature within half the distance of the structure's height must make a deck saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 5d6 bludgeoning damage, is not prone, and is buried in the rubble, requiring a DC 20 strength check as an action to escape. The DM can adjust the DC higher or lower depending on the nature of the rubble. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage and does not fall prone or become buried. Okay. So this could this is particularly devastating on a populated area. Little le- I mean still devastating but a little less so in a not populated area. Uh yeah, I <laughs> What do you mean? Like the loss I just of mean, life is? I no. I just mean like it's particularly devastating to buildings. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And it, it, basically, you hit Structures, a city area yeah. with this, you're gonna it do devastation. If you hit a forest, yeah, but it it'll be devastating. But I think a a, a degree less. Yeah, sure. Because like you're not gonna have a bunch of collapsed trees; they might fall over. Yeah, maybe. and they're not gonna cause as much damage as all the falling buildings will. You know? Truly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whew, that was a lot. Yeah, we got uh, we got some secret little gems that we <laughs> I don't know we had to read all the devastation orb stuff that that's the so this this earth one works the same way as the water one with to a the, certain degree the, yeah. yeah up until like you get to the earth stuff so you yeah. do you do the rituals they have the same measurements and weights and mm-hmm. HP and all that stuff and like yeah. the time you can put them in a jar like all that stuff and then we're gonna read two more like this after I give Iron Fang a seven out of ten I'm gonna give it a seven point five because I like it more. Then I like the shatter spell. This is a personal bias. That's fair. Yeah. Let's take a short rest. Yeah. It's the grand adventures of Ilian and Beard. <sighs> okay. uh, Beard. Beard, are you okay? I'm fine. There were so many geese. Oh, God. Why didn't you cast any magic? My beard is more feathers than beard. Uh. Uh, my my quarter staff did just fine at swatting geese out did, of the sky. You did hit. You you got a lot of them. I, was, like, like, I got some wombo combos in there. I feel like you could have just done one thing though. Uh, that's yes, fine. Who we knows? Got, we might need those spell slots. We hear right, Baron. and we got through it. And we did. I think I think maybe I, I need a rest so bad because I used up my action search and, and your I second used up wind. My second wind, yeah. Because you you saw when all twelve of them got on me, right? I, and you came I over. I did. You kind of got me in the back of the head a couple times. So you know what they say, Ben? Two birds, one stone. Two birds, one stone. I say, uh, I say, twelve birds, one ass. And I showed them. You saw that part, right? And that was great. They were like, "Whoa!" And then you bonked like six or seven of them right there. Yes, I had advantage on all those attacks. It was fantastic. Yeah, and then I stabbed a couple and. I cut that one that tried to leave, but I, I should probably run and go get my sword because I threw it as hard as I could. <laughs> and that thing, oh man, there's, you, you think it'd be two two geese laying down next to each other, but it's just one cut in, straight in half, like a baguette. You know what I mean? Oh boy. Nothing like nothing like icing some geese that are coming for you, huh? Yes, I feel uh, rather uh, vamped up, if you will. Uh, um, the, the, mu- the moon is so beautiful. I feel like there's nothing that can stop us, Beer. Nothing at all from yeah. claiming the next shard of substantial supporters. That would be so cool to get. You know what probably could stop us, though? What if the moon were like a big orb of destruction of some kind that like exploded in a bunch of celestial, av- an avalanche of pain? You know what I mean? That would be crazy. I'm I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm so tired. Yes. I would really like the shard. To, Coming to, up with ridiculous yeah. notions. Um, <laughs> I say we long rest, and tomorrow we make our way up the summit towards Creator's Crater. It does look steep. I can see a lot of switchbacks from here. I'm down. Let's do it. Let's do it. Sleep.
we've returned. Indeed we have. We're fucking back. Indeed we are. Ah! <laughs> so ah! many items. They're everywhere. Yeah, we've done six. We got five more. What a treasure trove of a dungeon cast. If you want to help us and Ilian and Bjorn with their endeavors and making the show and making it to Creator's Crater, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the dungeon cast and, uh, you know, making some sort of denomination of sorts there. That would be helpful in a lot of ways, and we really appreciate you guys. There should be a Patreon-voted episode coming up. Next. The next episode should be a patron-voted episode, and we've seen a lot of people come in. Thank you guys so much. We will be shouting you out on the next episode, and uh, we'll be detailing more about what you get by being a patron and et cetera next episode. Leave it for leave it for that. Uh, what do you got next for me, dude? <laughs> next up, we have Matala Talk. Matala Talk. Uh, also known as Frostfather or the Mall of Brutal Endings. My icy dad. This is a magical warhammer and was once the favored weapon of the demon lord. Oh, fucking Christ. I hate this dude. Demon lord Kostchi. 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 Kostchichi. Kostchichis. Kostchichi. Kostchiche. Kostchichai. <laughs> Did we get them all? Yeah. Right. Metalotok is a large black warhammer made of cold iron with inlays of nickel and silver. It is cold to the touch and is constantly surrounded by mist. That's cool. Metalotok is ancient and was crafted by Thrym, the giant god of cold and ice worshipped by the frost giants. At some point, it fell into the hands of the witch queen, Igvilv, who in turn bestowed it upon Kostchiki. That's right. She's all up in the demon stuff. Demon lord and patron of the frost giants in rage. The eventual prince of wrath wielded Metalotok to great effect, dominant his frost giants and even slaying three minor demon lords with the weapon. The Warhammer would remain in Kostki's <laughs> possession for many years until he was defeated by Zario. Oh, thank God. I love her name. It's so much easier to say. <laughs> Archduchess of Avernus. She took his hammer and chained him at the bottom of a uh, chasm, knowing that killing him would simply cause him to reform in his icy layer of the abyss. Mm, fair. Yeah. That's a good, a good, good move, Zario. Mm -hmm. You make some poor decisions, but that was a good that decision. That was a solid one. All right. All right. Tell me about Metallitalk. I will. Uh, oh, cool art. I like that. Very gothic. Mm -hmm. um, weapon, Warhammer, Legendary, requires attunement, Frost Father, etc. You are immune to cold damage while holding Metallitalk. Whenever it deals damage to a creature, the hammer radiates a burst of intense cold in a 30-foot radius sphere. Each creature in that area takes 10 or 3d6 cold damage. There you have it. There you have it. Um, okay. Much like with Drown, I got to give this weapon two ratings. Lore rating, 10 out of 10. Love it. Hate Kuskchi's name, but love it. Sure. Um, functionally, mechanically, four. I think this gets a four. Um, the burst is cool, but it hurts all creatures within the 30-foot radius of you. That's all your allies. Yeah, once again, I think this is more of an NPC item than right. a uh, than a item that you should wield as a PC player, like a, a player character. But y you know, because of that, I think I'll give it like the the five and a half. All right, uh, art rating is a, is a is a nine. Also, I love the name Metallotalk. Sounds cool. It, yeah, that is cool. It looks like I could buy this at like uh, Spirit Halloween. Like it would be very one of those cool. foam hammers. It would be very cool in like a plastic mold. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like absolutely. I would totally. It, it would look fucking rocking as a plastic mold. Hell yeah! All right. Next up, we have Tinder Strike. Tinder Strike is a unique flint dagger forged by the dra yeah forged by the Drow wizard Vizier and Devere and wielded by Vanifer, the prophet of fire and leader of the cult of eternal flame. It is a flint dagger with an exceptionally sharp blade. Whenever it strikes a hard surface, sparks fly from its edge, and after hurting someone with it, the blade smolders for a few minutes. The handle feels warm at all times. I like that. It's a fire dagger. Yeah, I'm into that. Yeah. Okay, let's go. I like fire daggers. I like fire daggers. Do people know what Spirit Halloween is outside of, of the like, U.S.? No way. No way. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's no just way. a Halloween costume shop that takes up residency in like vacated buildings yes for like a brief two month period of every year yeah um for for halloween or like the equinox or whatever i don't know but um for saint hollow's eve yeah that <laughs> you know that catholic shit where is tinder or is it oh, all hollow's it eve oh gosh it's all hollow's eve thank you all right tell me about tinder strike is it it's all saints day is it Whew, man we're deep yeah, in territory I was raised catholic <laughs> Were you? I was. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, Tell me about the fire dagger. Okay. It's Did we say it was flint already? Yes. Okay, cool. You gain a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls you make with this magic weapon. When you hit it, when you hit with it, the target takes an extra 2d6 fire damage. So nice. You give that to a rogue. That's so nice. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. bonkers d6s. Fire Master, you gain the following benefits while you hold Tinder Strike. You can speak Ignan, a subsect of Primordial, fluently. You have resistance to fire damage. Really good. That's really good. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. cast Dominate Monster, save DC 17 on a fire elemental. Once you have done so, Tinder Strike can't be used this way again until the next dawn. Uh, Dance of the All Consuming Fire. Wow, that, what a name. That's awesome. Devastation order. Uh, while inside a fire node, you can perform a ritual called the Dance of All-Consuming Fire using Tinder Strike to create a devastation orb of fire. And uh, once you perform the ritual, Tinder Strike can't be used to perform it again until the next dawn. The flaw is Tinder Strike makes its wielder impatient and rash. Uh, you can get a cream for that, though. While attuned to the weapon, you gain the following flaw. I act without thinking and take risks without weighing the consequences. Burn it all down. Mm, 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 go burn it all down. Very brash. Very brash. Uh, Devastation Orb. Let's go to the fiery one. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Fire Orb says when... So you do the ritual. Blah, blah, blah. 12-foot orb. Or 12-inch orb. All that jazz. Huh? All that jazz. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. The whole jazz. Mm -hmm. When this orb detonates, it creates a dry heat wave that lasts for 24 hours. When the area of effect... Uh, within the area of effect, the rules for extreme heat apply as detailed in Chapter 5 of the DMG. i got to read Chapter 5 of the DMG. Apparently. Shit. At the end of each hour, there is a 10% chance that the heat wave starts a wildfire in a random location within the area of effect. The wildfire covers a 10-foot square area initially, but expands to fill another 10-foot square each round until the fire is extinguished or burns itself out. The creature that comes within 10 feet of the wildfire for the first time on a turn or starts its turn uh, there, takes 3d6 fire damage. So a big <clears throat> hot spot. Makes a big yeah. hot spot. Yeah. And you take damage for being in it. Indeed. That's okay. Yeah, it's a wild fire creator, basically. The dagger is way cooler than the orb. Agreed. In this instance. Agreed. All right. Which is uh, kind of the opposite for the last two. A little bit. A little bit. I like the weapons, too. Me, too. Me but too, the yeah. orbs are much cooler. Yeah, this one was a little less devastating. A little less devastating. Um, for having a name like that, my God. Uh, keeping in mind that this, that this is a dagger and there's not like a plethora of amazing magical daggers, I give this a 7.5 out of 10. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and throw it the 8 because um, nice. that's the uh, a 2d6 fire damage on a dagger is pretty fucking good. Yeah, a dual wielding uh, a dual wielding rogue with thief rogue with two bonus actions. There you go. Not stab, bad. Stab, stab, stab. Not bad Although at all. you only have one, so I guess this... Daggers, whatever, but you're definitely doing the sneak attack with the fire one. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine, like, in the dark in the alley, sneak attack, <laughs> like yeah. a big eruption of That's fire? Cool. Very fun. I like it. All right. Next up, we have Wave, uh, another magical trident. Wave. Uh, rested from the dungeons beneath White Plume Mountain. We're going to Greyhawk, guys. All right. Its head is made of blue green steel, while its wooden shaft is carved with images of seaweed, sea creatures, and other aquatic designs. Wave is a sentient magical item originally created to help spread the worship of a god of the ocean, but now primarily seeks merely to avoid capture from Coraptus. <laughs> it's Coraptus, right? It's Coraptus? Yeah. Okay. Just say it fast so it sounds like Craptus. <laughs> An evil wizard of the Flayaness and the main antagonist of the module White Plume Mountain or anyone claiming to be Coraptus. Okay. Because there might be some imposters. All right. Wave is said to bequeath upon its wielder uh, the ability to control fish, breathe water, and dehydrate their op opponents. Ooh, dehydrate your opponents. I know. It's Aquaman Plus right yeah, there. It also warns of danger and creates cubes of force. Aquaman doesn't do that because it's a DC comic. It's for kids. He <laughs> but he does it in DC dark comics. He definitely de just dehydrates people. Really? No. Oh, okay. That'd be fucking awesome, though. <laughs> fucking Why wild. isn't that one of Aquaman's powers? You just w beat Superman real quick. No water in that guy. According to one legend, Wave was forged by Cyclops giants imprisoned on the distant island of Thunderforge by agents of a god of the ocean. Okay. The exact name of the deity varies from legend to legend. Some say it was Procon. Others say it was Blipdul Poop. Oh, it's been a while, yeah. Blipdul Poop. Hey, you're back. <laughs> Iedro, Poseidon, or Sekula. Do you remember Sekula? No. It's the devil shark that it lives in the frozen sea of Stygia. Is that a... Oh, 
No, I don't remember that at it's, all. It's That's the, fucking awesome, It's the though. main god of the Sahuagin. That's what I thought. It was yeah. a Sahuagin god. But, yeah. yeah. Wave was one of the pair of tridents forged by the same master. Its companion, Surge, was a lawful neutral trident dedicated to another deity, an ill-like demigod called Anguilusis. 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 Sahuagin. Sahuagin. It is said that the deity for which Wave was forged bore or sired a daughter with one of the Cyclopes, a half-cyclops called Dravenda. Dravenda sided with her giant kin in a rebellion against the sea god, wielding Wave against her own half-brother, another spawn of the deity who took the form of a giant crab. Though she defeated the half-divine crustacean, she fell in battle that day. No. Oh. Shortly thereafter, the wizard Caraptus came to the island... <laughs> In exchange for a promise of aid that would help the Cyclopes escape their prison, he was given Wave, which he eventually took with him to White Plume Mountain, his volcano stronghold. There he used it along with three other implements of power, Black Razor, Frost Razor, and Whelm, in a ritual to attempt to transcend the bounds of mortality. I was going to say, we talked about White Plume Mountain not we do- too long ago. Yeah, we, we've talked about it a couple times on this show. There's probably an episode about White Plume Mountain, because, like, <laughs> god damn, this is going, it's popping off at White Plume Mountain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They got a hell of magic item there. <laughs> or they did. <laughs> well, yeah. Eventually, a band of adventurers called the Brotherhood of the Tome raided White Plume Mountain and stole the four weapons, among other treasures. Wave was taken by a ranger called Elfin. Long after his retirement from adventuring, Elfin took the trident with him on his honeymoon. Disaster struck in the what? of a storm. <laughs> Dude, I love Greyhawk. <laughs> yeah, it's super wild every time we talk about it. <laughs> Which destroyed his boat and killed his bride. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Although the powers of Wave allowed Elfin himself to survive. Okay. <laughs> Swearing an oath of vengeance against the deity for whom Wave was created. There you go. Elfin traveled to Thunderforge Island. There he is said to have confronted an avatar of his divine nemesis before disappearing from history. So he died. He, he definitely died. <laughs> Got eradicated. Or did he? Decades later, Wave appeared oh. again in the hands of a wealthy collector in the free city of Greyhawk. The collector was much upset when a band of gnomes stole it from him and carried it back to White Plume Mountain. We're back! <laughs> We're back in White Plume. They, those items just find their way back to White Plume Mountain. The outraged collector went so far as violating the sanctity of the Greyhawk Thieves Guild in an attempt to find it. Finally, the collector deciphered the enigmatic clues left at the scene of the crime and hired a group of sellswords to steal it back. This they did, although in time a group of White Plume gnomes retrieved it once again, these gnomes are fucking unstoppable. Absolutely. This time, the gnomes were waylaid by the witch Thingizard, <laughs> the witch of the fens, who killed them and took the trident for herself. The witch of the fens is badass. That's badass. Yes. And also Thingizard or Thingizard is yeah, pretty cool. It is. It's, a, a, it's a, a fun a, name. It's a, a fun name to say. Name. Thingizard, the witch of the fens. Fuck yeah. Awesome. I, I love, love gnomes. Do, do you, does people on the show know how much I love gnomes? I don't think you've expressed it. No. I love gnomes so they're one of my favorite races in D and D. Bar none. Super cool, yeah. They're so fucking awesome. I love all their silly little names. I love Greyhawk. They have three oh. names. Gnomes do. They have three names. Usually, yeah. And oh. they like to go by like some people call them by like one name, but like oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I it's see. fun. They just have all these fun little tidbits. Yeah, lore. that's pretty cool. Uh. All right, tell me about Wave. Oh, yeah, we're not just going to read Whelm. We're going to read the rest of Wave stat block. Okay. To try it, legendary item requires attunement by a creature that worships a god of the sea. Doesn't matter which one. White Plume Mountain, yada, yada. You gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. If you score a critical hit with the target, uh, it take or if you scroll, if you score a critical hit with it, the target takes an extra necrotic damage equal to half its hit point maximum. Oh! What the fuck? Oh! That's bonkers. Oh! Okay, well, let's keep reading. Let's see, it's, there's that's a lot the, more. That's the first thing. There's you a lot do. more. The we- <laughs> the weapon also functions as a trident of fish command, if you wouldn't mind, uh, and a yeah, weapon sure. of warning. Uh, it can confer the benefit of a cap of water breathing while you hold it, which that's self-explanatory, and you can use it as a cube of force by choosing the effect. <laughs> oh God! Instead of pressing cube sides to select it. Okay, real quick, real quick. Um, where is the first one? That oh I my just God, opened? we'll close some tabs. You're Trident of Fish <laughs> Command. Trident is a magic weapon. It has three charges while you carry it. You can use an action, expend a charge to cast Dominate Beast from it on a beast that has an innate swimming speed. The Trident regains one three D3 tra- expanded charges daily at dawn. Okay, control so, fish. Aquaman. Yeah. Yeah. Or anything underwater. Right. Um, 
Anything web, underwater? Any underwater creature. Can, okay. Yes. Things that call the underwater places its habitat. Yes. Okay. A weapon of warning. The magic weapon warns you of danger. While the weapon is on your person, you have advantage on initiative rolls. That's advantage pretty on good. That's amazing. That's In addition, fucking good. you and any of your companions within 30 feet of you cannot be surprised. If I'm pers- okay. Except when incapacitated by something other than non-magical sleep. That's fine. The weapon magically awakens you and your companions within range if you... Any of you are sleeping naturally when combat begins. Wow. That's pretty good. Pretty incredible. Cube of force. Oh, God. <laughs> this cube is about an inch across. Each face has a distinct marking on it that can be pressed. The cube starts with 36 charges. Not 30, not, not 3d6, 36 charges. Oh, that's a lot. And it, it regains 1d20 expended charges daily later on. You can use an action to press one of the cube's faces, expending a number of charges based on the chosen face, as shown in the cube of force faces table. There's a table. You roll. It looks like a D6. Uh-huh. E- each face has, like, a set number of charges. Uh, rolling a six uh, takes zero charges, by the way. I rolled a one. You rolled a one. That takes one charge. Gases, wind, and fog cannot pass through the barrier. Okay. Yeah. So extra stuff. It does, extra it does a bunch stuff. of extra stuff. It could just do all this crazy barrier stuff. Okay, moving on. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Cap of water breathing, cube of force. All right. Sentience. Wave is a sentient weapon of neutral alignment with an intelligence of 14, a wisdom of 10, a charisma of 18. It has hearing and dark vision out to a range of 120 feet. You win D&D, Wave. The weapon communicates telepathically with its wielder and can speak, read, and understand Aquan. Uh, it can also speak with aquatic animals if using a speak with animal as spell, using. or as if using a speak with animal spell, using telepathy to involve its wielder in the conversation. Once again, if you have seen or read Aquaman, you know what's this up. This is Aquaman's weapon. This is an Aquaman. Well, this is if Aquaman was a weapon. Yeah, there we go. It's if Aquaman <laughs> was a weapon. You this shove that man weapon. inside of a trident. There you go. Uh, personality, when it grows restless, Wave has a habit of humming tunes that vary from sea shanties to sacred hymns of the sea gods. That's pretty Have cool. fun, DMs. Uh, Wave zealously desires to convert mortals to worship of one or more sea gods or else to consign the faithless to death. Damn. (laughs) Cool. Whoa. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Sounds about right. Conflict arises if the wielder fails to further the weapon's objectives in the world. There's a lot of weapons like that. The Trident has a nostalgic attachment to the place where it was forged, a desolate island called Thunderforge, a sea god imprisoned family sword giant. We kind of read that already. Um, Wave harbors a secret doubt about its own natur- nature, nature and purpose for all of its devotion to the sea gods. Wave fears that it was intended to bring about a particular sea god's demise. The destiny is something Wave might not be able to avert. Okay. Cool right. hooks. What, it doesn't matter what sea gods you want qu- quarreling. You can have them with yes, Wave. indeed you can. And you can be like a superhero of I the mean, sea. You can be fucking unstoppable. It's what? It's a 10 out of 10 weapon. What it's, the fuck it's is so this? so powerful. Okay, back to the first sentence. Plus three for damage and attack rolls. Yeah. If you score a critical hit with it, the target takes extra necrotic damage equal to half its hit point max. What? So you just, it doesn't matter how strong the creature, as a matter of fact, the stronger the creature is, the more damage it will do. You're going to nuke people like yeah. that. Yeah, that's just super, that's just about like it's, better than power word kill. Yeah, it's incredibly powerful. This is a dumb, stupid, dumb, strong weapon. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's up there with the strongest of them. Yeah. I think it's got great flavor. It's cool the strongest weapon stuff. that we've talked about today. It's a 10 out of 10 weapon. We didn't even get into all the cube stuff because that's a really long page. Yeah. So, man, wow. You can talk to animals. I think this that alone pushes it up to in the, I mean, the 10 range for it's me. It's helpful. You can also dominate animals. And then, like, okay, let's reread this real, real quick. I'm sorry to do this, but I need to know. A wet wave? Uh, the dominate monster. Oh, yeah. Oh, and dominate beast. Okay, so whatever it is, it has to be a beast. It can't be a kraken or yeah, a so dragon like a shark. Turtle. Yeah, it's like a shark or an octopus or something So literally like just Aquaman's normal yeah, range exactly. of stuff that yeah. he would summon to Absolutely. fuck you up. Yeah. A, a the of... weapon of warning, you have advantage on initiative rolls, cannot be surprised, and it wakes you up instantly. Bonkers. So you never even have just, to set watch. Just dumb. This, this item is dumb good. It's 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. This is a, probably the best one we're going to talk about today. <sighs> Until we bring its brother Whelm yeah. into the ring. Have you ever wondered what happens when you just you don't get overwhelmed? Like what happens before that, right? Well, here it is. Have you ever seen the Have you ever seen the movie Ten Things I Hate About You? Yeah, it's been a long time. I love that but movie. Yeah, 
There's a stupid line. She goes, I know you can be underwhelmed or overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can okay. you just be whelmed? Yes, you can. And D and D five E is here for you to help explain it. D and D five E is statted it out. <laughs> Whelm is a legendary warhammer of dwarven make. Whelm is plain and unadorned, with a steel head and a haft made from the golden wood of a ginkgo tree. When it's wielded, Whelm glows with a soft silver black light. Whelm has bonuses to attack and damage, and said to be more powerful in the hands of a dwarf. Oh, this is another one of those. I I work better if you're a dwarf. And right. Maybe I might turn you into a dwarf. Ah, oh, one of those. <laughs> I don't know if we, it, we've had know those know before. It magically returns to its wielder when thrown. It can de detect evil, secret doors, objects, goblinoids, giants, precious gems, and metals. It has the unfortunate tendency to inspire agoraphobia in its wielder. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> it is sentient and can communicate with its wielder. It constantly desires to hunt giants and goblinoids, telling its wielder this in terse phrases. This is essentially the acts of dwarven lords, but let's keep going. I had to look up a ginkgo tree. I didn't know what That's that was. That's a very, very ancient tree. It's it, beautiful. It dates way back to like the Permian period of whatever. It's an incredibly ancient tree. It predates the dinosaurs. Yeah, 290 million years ago. There you go. Welm was created long ago by a dwarven woman named Dagnal Mighty Hammer of Clan Dankill. It's, it's not older than sharks. Just sorry. It's a bit, no, one last side very bar. few things are. <laughs> <laughs> and, with, and with Wave, you can control those motherfuckers. So that's why that, this item's already been beat out by Wave. Hold on. I got to tell you the lore. Okay. So Dagnal Mighty Hammer of Clan Dan Kill, <laughs> a weaponsmith of some renown. She created the Warhammer in order to aid her clan against a group of marauding trolls that already claimed many of their number, putting all of her love for her husband, Traubon, her devotion to her clan, and her reverence for her god, Moradin, into the weapon. She gave it to her husband to use in battle. Cool. Traubon and the other dwarven warriors were victorious, and Welm became much praised. The times of woe were followed by years of prosperity, and Dagnall improved on Whelm, enhancing it with the ability to detect gems, gold, and other riches. Many years later, the clan was threatened by a horde of goblins and bugbears, and once again, Dagnall improved upon Whelm, her now aged husband insisting on leading the counter-assault. But though he was once again victorious, this time the elderly dwarf suffered a mortal wound and died. Oh. Overcome by grief, Dagnall threw herself on her husband's corpse, her own life giving out at that moment. <laughs> The two dwarves and their weapon were interred in a single grave, and it said that Dagnall and Traubon invested so much of their spirits into the hammer during their lives that it became more than mere steel and wood. And dwarves are weird. <laughs> the hammer, which now was imbued with sentience and a constant craving to hunt giants and goblinoids, <laughs> did not remain buried forever. Eventually, it fell into the hands of gnomes. These fucking gnomes, Fucking man. gnomes. Let's go. <laughs> and it was a group of gnomish servants of Karaptis. Yes. Who gifted it to their master approximately 1,000 years before the beginning of the common year calendar. That's Greyhawk timeline stuff. I don't know. Karaptis took it with him on his travels, bringing at last to White Plume Mountain. We're back again, babe. <laughs> <laughs> there in approximately 91. <laughs> The common year. Well, it was one of the four legendary objects. The others being Black Razor, Frost Razor, and Wave, used by Karaptis to open a gate into a distant shadowy realm, departing the material plane on a quest for immortality from which he may never return. Are you oh, so this dude pulled it off. Like, he wasn't like, I got this cran plan to be a god, and then Avengers broke it up. He's like, no, I did it. <laughs> I don't care what happens with the weapons now. Yeah, the adventure is watched this time. Are you giggling because it sounds so much like crap? Yes. Okay. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought that was it at first, and you just keep laughing. I like, want to make sure. Yeah, it is. Okay. In about 491 CY, a band of adventurers known as the Brother of the Tomb uh, raided White Plume Mountain, taking Whelm. Tome. And w a tome, sorry. Sorry. Taking Whelm with them, among other spoils. In about 550 CY, the Warhammer had found its way into the hands of a fearsome hunter of ogres called. Oh God! I think the sea is silent. I'm gonna I'm gonna Tenmir. lean into that. We'll go with Tenmir. When Tenmir fell prey to a vampire, his venturing companions recovered Whelm from him, bringing it to the city of Greyhawk to sell to a collector there. In Greyhawk, the weapon remained for around two decades before it was stolen by gnomes. Gnomes, <laughs> let's go. Serving a wizard claiming. <laughs> To be Karaptis. Oh, yeah, there it is. And giving it to the now vampiric Tenmir, the the curse to guard. So dude dies, becomes a vampire, comes back and grabs his hammer. I was wondering how much of a player fake Karaptis is going to be. And <laughs> apparently it's pivotal. So you got to worry about fake Karaptis. 
<laughs> False Coraptus. False Coraptus. All right. Now let's read the stat block. <laughs> it's like when you have to go to the bathroom, but then you just fart. <laughs> I hate it. I hate <laughs> it. All right. Let's see. All right. Let, give me give me whelm. Okay. I will give you the whelm. Shall I be whelmed? Let's see. <laughs> okay. Cool art. Once again, I like the hammer art. It's all good and detailed and doesn't look like a Mr. Crab submarine. Uh, Warhammer Legendary requires attunement by a dwarf. You gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. At the dawn... At dawn, the day after you first make an attack roll with Whelm, you develop a fear of being outdoors. Ooh. The agoraphobia, agoraphobia, right? Why? That, it never I, explains why. I don't know. Uh, that persists as long as you remain attuned to the weapon. I think it's an agoraphobia. Like uh, agoraphobia also include like crowded areas too. I'm pretty sure it's just outside. I think it's wide open areas is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Which um, I guess is the idea of you're a dwarf, you want to be underground. Fair. The sky is uh, displeasing. There's a. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Friends at the Table right now, but it's a cool show. You guys should go watch it. Uh, so as long as you remain tuned to the weapon, that's going to be a thing. This causes you to have disadvantage on attack rolls, saving throws, and ability checks while you can see the daytime sky. Yeah. So get what nighttime is like, oh, it's cool. It's like the ceiling. Uh, thrown weapon. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Whelm has the thrown property. Uh, with a normal range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet. When you hit with a ranged weapon attack using it, uh, the target takes an extra 1d8 bludgeoning damage or an extra 2d8 bludgeoning damage if the target is a giant, because fuck giants. Mm. Each time you throw the weapon, it flies back to your hand after the attack. If you don't have a hand free, the weapon lands at your feet. You ever notice that there's just so many weapons that absolutely despise giants, but we only had one today that was real good against dragons. I know, in a setting where that is the plot. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, because yeah. uh, dra- people were really tired of giants, right, in the lore, and then they were like, fuck giants. There's a new giant book out. Yeah, it's been out for a bit now. Yeah, do we care? Um, I've, you know, grabbed some stuff from it. We oh, own okay. it on the D&D Beyond just because I need to reference it. Oh, yeah, okay then. Sweet. <clears throat> Anything cool? I haven't looked that deeply at it, but it looks all right. All There's right. some cool feats from it if you like having elemental damage type a specialization man it's so they really do parse out that stuff a lot. like they kind of breadcrumb you to buy books huh mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah well uh where was i shockwave shockwave uh you can use an action to strike the ground with whelm and send a shockwave out of the point of impact each creature of your choice on the ground within 60 feet of that point must succeed on a dc 15 constitution saving throw or become stunned for one minute mm-hmm. a creature mm-hmm. can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns ending the effect on itself on a success once used, this property can't be used again until the next dawn. I like how everything, like how a lot of, th- not everything, a lot of um, saving throws work like um, like sleep in Pokemon, you know, where it just like goes away like forever, at, like once, oh. you, once you beat it. Yeah, in 4th edition it wasn't like that. In 4th edition it was... Um, it was like more punishing, right? Yeah, it was more punishing. It was like save ends instead of it just being, you know... Well, I guess... Well, save ends, right? Is that, is, yeah. is that what you're this, referring to? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, save ends. Yeah. I, I do you like save ends? I like save ends. Okay. I like save ends. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but like I don't like save ends. I I don't like save ends when they end at first turn. Like I yeah. kind of wish if it hits, then like stick around for it. Like you can start save ends one turn later. I don't know. That gets messy. <clears throat> yeah, it could be like it lasts for one d whatever rounds. You know, I like that too. That's, that's okay. Bad. Like a D four, roll a D four yeah. and like figure it out. Yeah. Just like stick with whatever. Yeah. Supernatural awareness. While you are holding the weapon, it alerts you to the location of any secret or concealed doors within 30 feet of you. In addition, you can use an action to cast detect evil and good or locate object from the weapon. Once you cast either spell, you can't cast it again from the weapon until the next on. Sentience. Whelm is a sentient, lawful, neutral weapon with an intelligence of 15, a wisdom of 12, and a charisma of 15. It has hearing and dark vision out to a range of 120 feet. The weapon communicates telepathically with its wielder and can speak, read, and understand dwarvish, giant, and goblin. It shouts battle cries in dwarvish when used in <laughs> combat. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Oh, That's no. Cool. I like it. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh, personality, Whelm's purpose is to slaughter giants and goblinoids. It also seeks to protect dwarves against all enemies. Conflict arises if the wielder fails to destroy goblins and giants or to protect dwarves. Mm. What is conflict? Like, it don't want to hang Like, if, if the Unattuned. person wielding it doesn't do those things when those things need to be done or are sensed as needed to be done. Fair. Yeah. Whelm has ties to the dwarf clan that created it, variously called the Dankil or the Mighty Hammer clan. 
it longs to be returned to that clan. It would do anything to protect those dwarves from harm. So these dwarves in particular, though. Yeah, it makes sense. It has the the dual spirits of these two dwarves from this clan. Yeah. Um, So it makes sense, yeah. The hammer also carries a secret shame. (gasps) Centuries ago, a dwarf named Tenmir wielded it valiantly for a time. Do I need to read this? We read that. But then Tenmir was turned into a vampire. Yeah, vampire. His will was strong enough that he bent Whelm to his evil purposes. Oh, wow. Even killing members of his own clan. That is a cool story twist. Indeed. In my O. Um, (laughs) Eight out of ten. Yeah, I'm going to give it... Eight out of ten. Hmm. Is not as overpowered as Wave. I want to give it a five so bad just because it's like, you know. I think it's a pretty good weapon. Me too, but just because his name is Whelm, and that would be funny. (laughs) So five out of ten. Okay. It's probably more like a seven, All right. a seven for me. We've made it to our final weapon, Wind Vane. Mm-hmm. Wind Vane was an enchanted spear, a spear, a spear forged by the drow wizard Vizier and Devere. Man, he was busy, dude. And oh, yeah. with the elemental evil of Yan C. Bin and wielded by Erisi Kalanoth during her time as leader of the Cult of the Howling Hatred. Wind Vane is depicted as a long silver spear with an ornate bladed end. Its bladed tip is beautifully carved and has blue-green gemstones embedded into it. Nice. Uh, we got a silver spear here. Uh, legendary requires attunement. You have a plus two bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls you make with this magic weapon, which has the finesse weapon property. When you hit with it, the target takes an extra 1d6 lightning damage. Air Mastery. You gain the following benefits when you hold Wind Vane. You can speak Aurin fluently. That's a subject of Primordial. You have resistance to lightning damage. <clears throat> you can cast Dominate Monster, save DC 17, on an air elemental. Once you have done so, Wind Vane can't be used uh, this way again until the next on. Song of the Four Winds. It's like a Legend of Zelda game. Indeed. Uh, while inside an air node, you can perform a ritual called the Song of Four Winds using Wind Vane to create a devastation orb of air. See that? Go, go look at that. Once you perform the ritual, Wind Vane can't be used again to perform the ritual until next time. Flaw. Wind Vane makes its wielder mercurial and unreliable. Uh, while attuned to the weapon, you gain the following flaw. I break my vows and plans. Duty and honor mean nothing to me. That's stark. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and we got the devastation orb here of wind. Uh, air. Sorry. When this... Orb detonates, it creates a powerful windstorm that lasts for one hour. Whenever a creature ends its turn exposed to the wind, the creature must make a DC 18 con save or take 1d4 bludge as the wind and debris batter it. It's not so bad. Yeah. The wind is strong enough to up oh, for an hour, though. Mm. The wind is strong enough to uproot weak trees and destroy light structures after at least 10 minutes of exposure. <laughs> Otherwise, the rules for strong wind apply as detailed in Chapter 5 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. So the least devastating of the four devastations, right? I, you know, it really just sort of is situational with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Because, like, depending on where you do this, like, I don't know, maybe you are flying airships and you let this bad boy loose up in the sky in, like, an Ur battle and like people are cool. just getting fucking tossed. Yeah, that like, they have recruited pretty crazy. Like, like your that. wings, I would consider maybe <laughs> like on smaller vessels, light structures, and you're yeah. just getting bashed for minutes on end, and you got to you got to go land or you crash. Yeah, absolutely. Like it really just depends. Yeah, uh, like a small town, like a fishing village, like yeah, this is a wreck it. Just yeah. floor the whole thing. Like oh, that's a bummer. That's a maybe bummer. not as like. You know, the Earth... It's not as life-ending as all the other ones. Yeah, Earthquake is going to fuck shit up real bad. The tsunami worth of stuff is going to, like... So the fire one and the air one are just sort of a little weaker, more situational. Yeah. Could be devastating, depending. Like, it just depends. I give this weapon an 8 out of 10. Uh, I love the wind element. Mm -hmm. I love the lightning damage type, um, which it does both. And I really love pole arms, and it's a spear. And... As a finesse weapon property, which I feel like more pull arms, not all of them, but just a couple, could use the finesse weapon property. I feel like they, like historically, are more finesse weapons than strength weapons. But maybe I'm wrong there. Mm. Okay, I, no, I like it. I, I think I'm going to give it like the seven point five or seven that okay. I was giving the other ones. Well, that was eleven legendary weapons of Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Ah, let's take a long rest. Let's take a long rest. Hey, everybody, welcome to The Long Rest. This is the part of the episode where I put on 
slippies that will cause natural devastation and stabbings to the likes of which you've never seen in a <laughs> variety of 11 facets. Yes. The most the most dangerous slippies for well I had to it took an hour to put them on. It was weird. <laughs> I don't know. You got a slippy. You got a slip. You got no. You got slippy stuff for me. I don't. I don't wear slippies. You did like last up. I don't wear slippies. I want Tinder strike. I want Tinder strike slippies. I want knives in my. All right, in fine. My I want slippies. I want um wave slippies. I want Tiamat's heads on each of my slippies. I want a dragon to fuck a hydra. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dragon slippy and a hydra slippy, and I just sort of smush them together. <laughs> Holy Christ. <laughs> okay. So um, find us on social media. That would be too cool of you. The links are in the description. We got threads. We got Instagram. We got X, formerly known as Twitter. We have uh, Mastodon. Yeah. And uh, we have Discord. That's probably the real big one to me. It's my favorite. You can find me on uh, on Instagram at Sound Good Inc. Um, mostly uh, posting pictures of my, stories of my turtle. And uh, mm, uh, mm, P.O. Box, email, shop, merch shop. All in the description. Yeah, go check them notes, dude. Just go check the notes. Uh, and then uh, Star Seeker's Guide to Dragon Star, which is uh, coming to a, a head-ish. Yeah, um, still writing Star Seeker's Guide to Dragon Star. We have five of the eight chapters completely finalized. Ooh. Moving into the final three. Um and yeah, it's a space opera science fiction Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition source book with eleven new races or species, um, <clears throat> a custom species creator, um, thirteen new subclasses, a whole menagerie of alien be beasts, uh, entirely new magic uh, technological device and magitech section, along with twelve new artifacts. Um, and just much, much more. So if you're interested in helping us create this project, go ahead and pre-order at drakenstar.com. The link is in the description. Yeah, man. Go check that shit out. Um, fuck. Um, we can't decide if we're actually going to do an Alien and Beard skit because we've been recording for like fucking nine hours. Um, yeah. So I hope there's one. We're going to try to figure it out right now. Um, but if there's not, sorry, there will be next time. And... Um, Man, I uh, did we forget something weird? Where oh, let us know what you want for giveaways. We saw a couple of suggestions, but not very many, and that's fine. Just we want to know though, because you'll be the one getting the stuff. You, the one winning. You know who you are. Wink. <laughs> I winked at Will, kind of, but like you can't see that right now. You get it though. Let's call it a game. Let's call it a game. We'll talk to you guys later. Dungeon Cast.